Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we share wisdom and practical tips to help you grow stronger in all areas of your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who offer real world experiences that you can apply to your own journey. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I am committed to interviewing guests who will inspire and challenge you, and that is definitely going to be the case today. If you enjoy my podcast, I would love to have you give me a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. And my podcast is brought to you by my company, Performance Support Systems. We publish software tools and books for improving the way people communicate with each other at work. And you can learn more about our tools and books at growstrongleaders.com. Today, I am really excited to introduce you all to and to have as my guest, Tom Kolditz. Tom, welcome to my show. Thank you, Meredith. It's an honor to be here. Well, it's just going to be a fabulous conversation. I can hardly wait to get started. But first, I want to prepare my audience for who they're about to hear from, because your credentials are so impressive. But I will tell you up front before I do the more formal part, I'm just so impressed with you as a human being and the focus of your work, the passion you have for what you're doing and the commitment you have to developing strong leaders. It's just remarkable. So this is going to be exciting for my listeners to learn more about your important work. And Tom is the executive director of the Door Institute for New Leaders at Rice University. And this will sound like bragging, but I'll tell you, he's going to be able to cite evidence for every one of the things I'm about to say. It's the most comprehensive, evidence-based, university-wide leader development program in the world. And Tom is very well qualified to be in this role because of his background. He's a retired brigadier general, and for four or excuse me, 12 years, he was at West Point and led the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership. And then he spent four years at Yale, and he was the founding director there of the Leadership Development Program in the Yale School of Management. So Tom knows how to start things, keep them going, and get fabulous results. And he's also the co-author Uh, with my good friend Libby Gill of this very important book, which we're going to get into today, called Leadership Reckoning. Can higher education develop the leaders we need? So, Tom, are you ready? I am. I am. Thanks for that terrific introduction. Thank you. Well, first of all, I I know my audience will be curious, what was it about this opportunity at Door Institute um, for New Leaders that caused you to say yes? Because really, you're not just the executive director, you're the founding director. You were there from the ground floor, right? So what caused you to say yes? Well, you know, I love being on the ground floor of leader development enterprises. This is my fifth startup. And um, what I really liked about it was uh, John Doerr's attitude about uh, founding this institute at Rice University, his alma mater. Um, And it was clear that he not only wanted an exceptional leader development process available to Rice students, which he did not benefit from and was somewhat disappointed in, but he also wanted the institute to become sort of a leader and developer of the spectrum across higher education. So, you know, John Doerr put the money under companies like Google and Amazon and Netflix and other highly successful enterprises, and he thinks very big. So his approach to founding the Doerr Institute, uh, hiring me to do that, was to go big. And uh, I love that. 
it's such a good fit for you. And I want to get you to talk about what is it about this leadership program that's so different and unique and what sets it apart? Because so many colleges and universities do have these leader programs for students as they're going through college, but yours is different in a lot of different respects. So I would love for you to kind of itemize what some of those are. Sure. So uh, most leader development programs at colleges and universities are relatively small scale. Often students are uh, selected as uh, elites to do it. Um, and uh, often they have to compete to get in. Our program is available to every single student at Rice, graduate and undergraduate across all seven schools of the university. And most leader development programs at universities are under a school, like a business school or an engineering school. Uh, it is, however, a characteristic of rights because of its widespread availability. In addition, uh, most leader development programs at colleges and universities are very entertaining, but often they don't use evidence-based techniques and almost universally, they don't measure their outcomes in any kind of sophisticated way. And this is true of even the top 10 universities in the United States. They simply have not addressed leader development as a serious obligation. Uh, and we do. Uh, we measure every one of our programs independently and objectively. And what that means is we have a team of research psychologists who do all of the assessment of programs in uh, the Door Institute. No one who runs a program gets to grade themselves. And, uh, and, and that's almost unheard of uh, at other universities, although we're working hard to, to show others that it can be done uh, well, inexpensively, and to the same standards that colleges and universities approach everything else that they do. You know, colleges and universities are generally centers of excellence. And by far, when it comes to leader development, they are centers of mediocrity and ineffectiveness. And we're trying to fix that. Well, there are so many things that, that you all thought through and thought about in, in setting up this particular program. And I would like for you to talk a little bit more about what you mean by evidence-based. Give me an example of something you have adopted and maybe something that you decided was not going to be a part of your program because when you tried it, you didn't get the results that you expected or hoped for. Sure. So, you know, often in universities, because there are a lot of researchers, uh, people try to derive programs from research. And we don't do that, although we're very familiar with, with the uh, cutting edge research and leader development. What we do is try to use techniques that we have seen work elsewhere. So, we, so the building blocks of all of our programs, we've seen being used effectively either in industry or the military or other um, places. And to us, although we do focus on evidence-based planning and design, to us, the real test is the objective measurement of results of the programs as we do them. Because it's one thing to say a program should work. It's another thing to say, we know it works. And so it's that pairing of the, the uh, evidence base of the design, and then the ruthless measurement of outcomes uh, on the backside to determine if it's having any effect on students. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've had some situations where you would have predicted a certain element that you introduced to the program was going to be highly effective, but then when you actually did the measurement of it, you realize, no, that's not going to, because one of the things that impressed me with your book is the fact that you're, you're ruthless about eliminating things 
that don't prove themselves. You don't get wedded to a specific strategy or element that doesn't prove itself. Right. I mean, we found many things. And, you know, one of our programs um, that we that we looked for outcomes and didn't really find them is a program we refer to as excursions, where a coach and a facilitator will take 10 or 12 students and they will visit a prominent leader in the Houston area or beyond if it's uh, online. And then following that visit, maybe 90 minutes of that person discussing how they lead and what they've learned about leadership, uh, we would have an hour and a half long facilitated discussion with those students about what they had learned and how they intended to apply it. And we thought that was a really um, elaborate intervention. Uh, All real world professionals involved in the delivery, top tier leaders. Uh, We got no effects in that program. None None that we could measure on leader identity, and other variables, psychological variables that are valid and and that we use all the time. And we have continued that program knowing that we don't get leadership effects because it is also a community engagement program. So we appreciate the value of our students talking to leaders like the chief of police or the CEO of a uh, art museum or a major government official in Houston but they don't learn to lead, at least not in a way that we can measure and that lasts. Mm -hmm. They're inspired by it. They, uh, you know, discuss what leadership is. So they learn some things about leadership, but when they walk into their next club or when they go to their athletic team, they are not changed in a way that makes them a better leader. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of, of discovering that something we do doesn't work. Yeah. And I remember you talking about the colleges that have big budgets for bringing in these external speakers for like an hour or or even two hours. And that also does not have lasting impact. So that's not where you've chosen to put your dollars. One of the areas that I think, and you'll have to tell me if this is really unique to your program, but it seems like it's rare, is the use of coaches. And I love your commitment to having coaches work with the students. Talk a little bit, because as I'm asking you these questions, I'm thinking about my listeners, many of whom are not in college and in universities, but they are involved in training programs for leaders in their organizations, or they even conduct training. And interesting timing, Ken Blanchard just published an article on LinkedIn about the lack of coaches with their training programs early on. He said this is the one regret he has with what they have done with their earlier trainings is they didn't immediately have coaches involved because they have seen since bringing in coaches to be used as a follow-up with their programs, what an impact that would have made. And you have started, I think, pretty much from day one, right? Having coaches involved with the students. Talk about the structure of that and how that works in terms of the meetings with students and what they do. Sure, well, some quick history. Uh, When I was at West Point, I led the academic department, behavioral sciences and leadership. And over that 12 years, I recognized that students were really not learning to lead in our classrooms. They were learning to lead when they were doing real world projects like planning land navigation courses or rifle ranges or other kinds of training events. And they were coached by young army officers who were assigned to West Point to do that. And so I realized that when you're in the context of something that you're already interested in and passionate about, and if you are guided in your in your leadership you you learn to lead and when i went to civilian institutions like yale and rice of course there weren't any army captains walking around um so i had to have people with the knowledge skills and abilities to deliver 
and enhance the learning that our students were going to go through. And far and away, the best people I've found to do that are cert trained and certified coaches. And we use International Coach Federation uh, coaches because of the training that they get. Uh, and then when we look to see if they're able to create a shift in leader identity or a change in leadership skills and abilities or a change in the emotional intelligence makeup of our students, we find they're very successful at that. It works. Uh, so, you know, we make coaches, professional coaches from the Houston business community available to every student at Rice who wants one free of charge for a semester. And we, we uh, connect the coaching client, the student client, and the coach. We, um, we don't arrange a location or a time. That's all between the student client and the coach themselves. So there's very little administrative overhead. Mm. Uh, and we use coaches who are vendors. We don't hire coaches full time because that's very expensive and inefficient. And so if you want to be able to do this in a university environment, you, you really have to hire them by the hour or, or it's just too expensive. And we're able to deliver this program at half the cost of classroom instruction, which is when you look at classroom instruction in universities, it's actually very expensive to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, but these kinds of coaching opportunities are, are inexpensive. And the process itself fits the student culture because the students get to pick the time and place that they're going to be coached. So it fits with their schedule. You know, at top end universities, time is the coin of the realm. And so if you have a fixed schedule that you're trying to sell to students, trying to get students to, to occupy, it's very hit or miss. But when you put the power in their hands, it works. Mm -hmm. And so give an example, because you mentioned the word context, and I know that's really critical for it to be relevant and to have the lasting impact, because what you're really looking for is preparing these students to be leaders. So when they get hired, they're ready to step into a leadership role, whether it's a position title or just, you know, within the organization exhibiting leadership quality. So talk a little bit about some success stories of how these students work with a coach and end up being effective because of the way they apply what they're learning. Sure. Well, first in terms of context, understand that the coaches work with the students in the context of what these students are already active in and passionate about. So a uh, a cellist in the music school will be coached in the context of the quartet or the orchestra. A engineering student will be coached in the context of an engineering project. A student athlete will be coached in the context of their team and so forth. So it really doesn't matter what their major is or, or whether or not they're in a formal leader role. All students, and I mean 100% of them, have sufficient interpersonal interaction that a coach can use that interaction for application and practice and to help them learn leader skills. Uh, and we've had tremendous successes. I mean, we've had students leave uh, Rice, immediately start their own businesses when they thought they could. I mean, I had a, a woman come to me um, and say, she was from China, and she said, you know, I didn't think that leadership was ever in the cards for someone like me. So I came to school to study and, and to learn. And now I think I can start my own company. You know, I mean, just hard transformations like that. We had a, a, a woman who was studying political science and uh, she had given up on a career in journalism because she just couldn't, she just couldn't connect the dots. She just couldn't figure out how she would become a leader in a journalistic enterprise. And one of our coaches worked with her for a semester and she completely changed her major. She, she started focusing on what she wanted and she tells us, now I can achieve the dream that I had. 
that I had given up on before because I just couldn't put it together. I couldn't figure out how to get it done. Um, we've had tremendous success in diversity initiatives. So um, recently we had an article of, of, uh, about us appear in Fortune magazine because um, subsequent to the, the George Floyd murder, uh, we made a decision to offer a professional coach to every activist in the university who wanted one. We reached out to them and just said, hey, you know, you, you were obviously passionate because you're an activist and it's a great time to learn to lead. Why don't you take one of our coaches and, and learn to lead while you're, while you're exhibiting all this passion and, and interest? Uh, we've also found that among Black, uh, Latinx, and Native American students at Rice, that their retention rate is almost 10% higher if they've been coached. Um, making it one of the most powerful diversity programs at the, at the university with no intention. It wasn't our intention to get that effect. It's just a return on investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of our students feel powerfully influenced by their coaches. And 98% of them tell us that they would recommend coaching to a fellow student. So most of our marketing has become word of mouth student to student, um, which I think is what all of us wants for our businesses, right? I mean, we want, we want that kind of satisfaction that goes word of mouth that makes marketing all, all that much easier. Absolutely. And how long does your program last? Can a student go through all four years or does it have a, a specific time frame? No, we have 17 separate programs and opportunities for students. So it's for our most enthusiastic students, many of them do something every semester with us over okay. the course of four years. And we have some, some digital badges they can earn for being particularly active, but we don't give credit. Um, you know, we don't give certificates because we don't wanna externally motivate our students. Almost everything they do at a university is for some kind of carrot that's hung out there, you know? And, we know from the, from the leadership literature that people develop best when they are intrinsically motivated to develop. I mean, it's, it's hundreds of studies on that. So, so we avoid this external motivation of college credit and certificates and little gold stars and, you know, that sort of thing. And we want students who want to learn to lead better. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also why we don't envision our programming will ever become mandatory for all students. Uh, there are students who are just not interested in leadership. There are students who have a deep belief that they're already leaders. Uh, you know, there are students who believe that people can't change. And we don't want any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we want the ones who want to grow and want us to help them grow. I love that. Well, one of the things I want to talk to you about, because I remember this from our first conversation, it was like, wow, that's impressive. You were telling me that you have many people in that chief human resource officer role at corporations that are kind of banging the door down, really wanting to hire your students. And I thought, you know, now that is a testament to the effectiveness of your program. I would like for you to talk about what is it about the students who graduate from your leadership program compared to other university and college leadership programs? Where are they falling short compared to what yours are prepared to do? What capabilities, what characteristics? Sure. So many, many collegiate leader development programs are based on classroom instruction, uh, internships, things like that. And um, they tend to be one size fits all. You know, there's a leadership plan or there's a leadership curriculum. And we work with one student at a time. So whatever that student's need is, they express that to their coach. That's where they develop. And the student is expert at what they need. But when you have a group of students sitting in a class, leading, listening to someone lecture about leadership, or, or even if the class has 
you know, applied aspects, uh, you know, between class sessions. It, it's too structured um, in ways that don't match the needs of each individual leader. Um, and I think it's really the tailoring uh, that helps us. I mean, if we have a student who, as, as a leader, isn't sufficiently assertive and lacks confidence, we work on that specific thing. We don't work on just some broad emotional intelligence uh, characteristic or uh, giving feedback or you know, any of the other leader competencies that are commonly taught as if they don't know how to do that. We focus on what they think they need and they're really good at, at being honest about it and at, and at recognizing what their needs are. Um, and so, so our students are actually changed. I mean, we measure change in uh, leadership capacity by looking strongly at leader identity. The, the idea that they now think they're a leader, they intend to lead in the future, they have greater confidence as leaders. So we change that in a quantitatively measurable way. And as a result, our students earn about $10,000 more in their first job than their peers. Um, and we have had uh, companies very interested in hiring our students. One oil company, uh, human resource officer, wanted a direct pipeline of students from our program into their company. And we turned them down because we don't want students come, coming to us because they think we can get them a job. Mm. We want them to come to us because they want to learn to lead. But at the same time, we showed that, that human resource officer how to hire students who had been through the door too when they come to Rice and recruit. So, and, and look, you know, companies spend huge amounts of money on very basic leader development and leadership training every year. And so for a company to get someone that's been through serious leader leadership training, you know, not a couple ropes courses and a retreat somewhere, but, you know, serious executive quality leader development, they can save a lot of money. You know, not only do they get better performance, but they can continue that person's development at a higher level of sophistication. So all of this translates into money savings for companies. Mm -hmm. and better performance of their employees, which also affects the bottom line. Um, I want to look at specifically, what are some of the things that these students who go into these employers, what is it they're able to do that someone who hasn't been in your program would not be as equipped to do? When you say, you know, they're stronger, they're better prepared to be leaders, Give examples of some concrete things that they're able to take on, say, as a project or as a role that lets them excel. Sure. Well, um, you know, we have multi-session workshops focused on things like giving feedback and delegating uh, authority and, you know, straight up leadership skills. And so... Students tend to pick the ones that they feel a lack of confidence in, that they want to be better in. And so our graduates walk right through the door and they're already um, performing at a level higher than their peers. Um, our students also tend to want to take on leader roles. And that alone puts them way ahead of many of their peers who are sort of, you know, concerned about whether they can lead and, you know, is running a team really for them. I mean, our people just jump into that. And it's interesting that one of the, one of the most aggressive groups we've found are biochemists and biomedical engineers. And the people that are at the grad level getting PhDs in those because they know they're going to be running labs they know they're going to be responsible for grants, millions and millions of dollars, so that if that lab team does not perform, that money goes away. 
And so they're very eager to learn to lead and they're in very high demand uh, in labs where uh, maybe there's a little less confidence in a purely academically trained PhD, but one that has on their resume all the things that they can accumulate at the Door Institute, you know you're hiring a scientist who can run a lab. Mm -hmm. here's, here's the ugly truth. Most PhD scientists are not trained to run a lab. And then they're given a lab. So it, it's a very high demand um, quality and characteristic in graduates. Mm -hmm. This is so cool. One of the things I want to get into next, I, I know is near and dear to your heart. And I think this is really important for the people listening to this. You and everyone at the Door Institute, your ultimate goal, talking about big picture, is not just to build up the very best leader development program in the world and be the model. It's really to spread the word and get more colleges and universities committed to doing some of the same aspects. You're not trying to lay out a blueprint with steps one, two, three, four, right? You want to set up an example that they can then adapt to what suits and fits their specific university. Talk about the program that you've helped to, uh, through your partnership with um, Carnegie, um, Carnegie Foundation, right? What is it you are currently doing that to me is just so exciting in taking this to the next level? Sure. Well, the, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, among other things, uh, classifies all of our universities in the country, about 4,000 of them. And uh, so, for example, Rice is an R1 research university. That means we achieve certain levels of quality in research. Uh, other schools might be doctoral professional schools. They classify community colleges and so forth. But they also are beginning to experiment with optional classifications that a university can apply for um, and achieve. And so we have joined with them to co-create a classification in leadership education and development called Leadership for Public Purpose. And it encompasses business leadership and all, really all kinds of leadership. Um, and we're gonna make that available starting in January, February timeframe to all 4,000 universities in the, in the United States. And we already have a coalition of 129 schools representing 2.5 million students that are on board with us to do these kind of improvements in leader development in their institutions. And we expect that once we publicly release that classification, uh, the consortium will grow from 129 to probably 400 schools in, in two years. And so we'll be impacting between 10 and 15 million students through that programming. Um, it's wonderful scale. Um, and so talk from a practical perspective, how does that work with the classification that you're doing? How would an, a university or college go from learning about what is that classification to actually achieving that status? Yeah, so, so once they find out about the classification and you know, many colleges already have creating leaders in their mission statement or their vision. So, they find out about the classification and uh, we provide them with an application. And it's an application that's usually filled out by a, a committee because it's, it's truly at university level. We're not, we're not evaluating a program. We're evaluating a university. So it asks questions about uh, who in the university is developed, our staff developed, our faculty developed. Do students have leadership curriculum? Do they have co-curriculum? What's the budget like for leader development? And so uh, if they decide they want to apply for the classification, they, play, they pay us a small fee, uh, which we use to pay reviewers. And we send their application out to uh, reviewers. And it's, it's reviewed kind of like a journal article. I mean, it's a peer review process. 
Uh, and then they either achieve the classification and they're listed as such by Carnegie, or we, we notify them they did not achieve it and nothing is said. Uh, there's no, there's only carrot here, there's no stick. So, uh, you know, no real chance of embarrassment or, or failure. Uh, so it is a self-examination. Uh, they fill out their application. We don't snoop around and check on that. Um, and from our perspective, once they have done the self-study, we've achieved what we wanted. Because just as you described, you know, we're not selling a specific process. We're selling improvement in leader development. And that's going to take a different form in every college and university in the country. So, we're, you know, trying to sell them something or be prescriptive wouldn't do any good. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's our, that's our first major strategic initiative. We have another one where we are providing a course free of charge to graduate students on how to measure leader development effects in educational context. And the reason we're, we're focused on graduate students is number one, uh, in order to do this kind of measurement work, you have to have some statistics, you have to have research design classes at the graduate level. But even more importantly, once we train them and we'll give them a little certificate so they can put that on their beta, um, when they graduate with their PhDs, they go everywhere. And so we're able to seed higher education with people who, when confronted with, uh, oh, well, you can't measure leadership, can say, well, perhaps you don't know how to measure it, but I do. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will, we will keep track of those individuals so that if, you know, if you're at a big school, let's say the University of Illinois, and you're taking on a leadership program. But you, but you don't know how to measure leader development effects. Well, you can go to our list of PhDs who took our course and find the one who's at the University of Illinois and contact them and collaborate with them in order to get your, your program properly evaluated. And that's just one more strategic uh, technique to improve the quality of leader development programming. Because if you can't measure your outcomes, you're flying blind. You know, you really, you really don't know if what you're doing is merely entertaining students or if it's making a difference. And frankly, universities have higher standards than that. You know, I mean, universities are, you know, where we create knowledge about biophysics and you know, literature and history. And so their standards should be just as high for their leader development programs as it is for anything else that they do. And, and we're just interested in making that happen and creating more and better leaders. We don't sell anything. We don't uh, demand that they do X, Y, or Z. All we want is for them to professionalize their efforts. And, and we're going to be examples and we're going to be helpful and, and we're going to have a lot of people that want to do this. Uh, we have gotten zero pushback. I mean, everyone that talks to us is excited about it, wants to have leader development improve at their universities. Uh, many of them just kind of slap their foreheads and say, well, you're right. You know, we don't do this well and we want to do better. So. Uh, it's pretty exciting uh, for us. We have a, a very strong sense of purpose. I can tell. And I love the energy behind everything you're saying. It's, it's fantastic. Now, I'm curious, what level of person at a college or university are you targeting as the, the, the main person, I guess, that would be your point of contact to educate and inform about this? I think it's at the president level, right? Yes, well, you know, we, we do talk to presidents and provosts quite a bit, uh, chief human resource officers quite a bit. Uh, we had the team here yesterday from Texas Tech System, which, which represents five schools, um, and, and they were here. Um, 
because we are focused at the university level, someone who's at the bottom of the food chain just struggling to run their program doesn't really have the leverage to cause a lot of change at their university. We welcome them as individuals into our consortium. But the reality is to, uh, to create change, you have to have leaders. And so we, we sent our book to the provosts and university presidents of the top 200 universities in the country, three copies each. And we've gotten a tremendous response from everywhere. University of Pennsylvania, Northwestern, uh, University of Texas, you name it. But here's the, here is one of the characteristics of leader development in universities now. Nobody's in charge. They don't have a chief leader development officer or a, a dean of leader development. You know, they have deans of students who are saddled with everything from the alcohol program to COVID testing to, I mean, you name it. But there is no one in charge of leader development. And so often the people who uh, are our gateway into the university are respected professors that are teaching leadership or running a leadership program perhaps in the business school, perhaps in a school of engineering. The professional schools have taken this on faster than the more traditional humanities and social science and so forth. Um, and and so, so they're the ones who organize a committee in their university to respond to the application. And um, the presidents and provosts are grateful for that. But in, if, if we waited until a university had someone who was in, in charge of leader development, we wouldn't go anywhere because mm -hmm. very, very seldom is that the case. What happens is they find out about the Carnegie classification. They find out what we're doing at the Door Institute. And then the president points to someone, maybe the dean of the business school or maybe the dean of student affairs or you know, maybe a vice president for development or, you know, someone and says, OK, we're going to get this classification and you're in charge now. And then all these good things start happening. Uh, and, and that's the process. That's the real world process. Mm -hmm. It would be great if we could call the leader development person at a university. They don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you're getting uh, a lot of interest from the corporate level, wanting to know what you're doing that they could then adapt for their own leader development programs? Yes, I mean, we do get a lot of interest. We, uh, uh, in fact, we've done some work with Fortune on their Fortune Connect platform, which is a leader development um, process for Fortune 500 leaders mostly middle management leaders. Um, we've, we've taught them our process of delivering multi-session workshops called Catalyst Modules. Um, and they have used that very successfully. We've taught for them. They've taught their own that way. Um, the principles that we use in colleges and universities are equally, if not more applicable in business settings because you're you're coaching and developing people in the context of their work and 20 25 years ago 30 years ago everybody was excited about um, about corporate universities GE Crotonville or you know Boeing and Florissant or or wherever and and they did some good work there you know but they had a lot of speakers and uh, it would take people away from their work for three weeks. Well, away from your work is no longer the best place to learn. Right. And it's much less expensive to keep a person at work, to give them a coach, to give them, you know, directed training and development and, and let them learn that way with their, with their peers and with their uh you know, the people that are on their team. Uh, 
So everyone is changing in the direction that the Door Institute is going in colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing I forgot to mention when I introduced you was that I also had read about you in the book, The Vision Code by my friend, Oleg Konovala. And there he, I remember reading one of the passages where you were talking about, you know, the vision for Door and how you had um, turned away from uh, people encouraging you to also go after the high school level. And so we're kind of going the opposite way that's applicable to corporate, but you said no to high school. Why? <clears throat> high school is an entirely different landscape than colleges and universities. So the students are younger in terms of their cognitive development, their ability to even understand some leadership concepts. Um, the high school um, typical student body is extraordinarily diverse, and many people there have absolutely no intention of being a leader in any way, you know, maybe 10% or, or 15%. But even along with that, the scope and scale of high schools, you're talking 30 million students. You know, when you say you're going to take that on, you really have to do the math and say, is this possible? You know, I can impact a thousand universities. I know I can. And we're going to do that. And that should take care of probably 20 million students having better opportunities for leader development. But high schools are like 20 times that. And, um, and then lastly, I will also say that most high schools, everything that happens there is a zero sum game. If you have a new leadership program, you've got to take away some other program. And not only do you have to do that, but you probably have to convince the, the uh, Board of Education and maybe even the state legislature. And so people who are interested in developing leadership programs for high schools, one of the first things I tell them is you need to get to know your state legislature because the only way this is going to happen is if they make it a law for it to happen. And, and so that's why, that's why we didn't focus on, on high school as the keyhole that everyone's going to pass through who's, who's going to be a leader. It's, it's much more pragmatic, much more effective at college level. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, it makes perfect sense that you would have that focus because it's still quite broad, even with the focus. What, and I could continue talking to you for hours, but we do need to, um, bring this to a close, one of the final things I would love for you to talk about, what are the key principles? I know that DOOR operates under certain principles. And if you could just talk briefly about those and what's important about them that other colleges and universities or even businesses should take into consideration as they look at their own leader development programs. Sure, so we, own, we have four. Uh, that guide everything we do. And the first one is uh, that we view leader development as a core function of a university. So if you believe your university is supposed to educate people and you don't care about them becoming leaders or you don't care about them applying their education, we can't be of, of help. But most universities do view themselves as committed to developing students as leaders. So core function of the organization, same in business. Um, then we use evidence-based techniques. We only use professional people. So if you go around to universities, they'll say, yeah, we have a leader development program. It's led by alumni volunteers, or we have students who have peer coaches or other kinds of amateurish um, people running the programs, untrained mentors. We only use professional people and we define them as people for whom leader development is their primary occupation, professional coaches, professional facilitators, and so forth. And, uh, and they're, not, they're not prohibitively expensive compared to university professors in particular. Uh, and then the fourth, measure outcomes. 
objectively independently. And objectivity and independence are two of the first things you learn about measurement when you are in grad school and you know learning about how to assess things. And uh, you know, if you have people measuring the effects of their own programs, they're going to come to you with a fistful of student emails saying how wonderful the program is, and they're going to say, "See, our program works," and probably not. So. So objective measurement, either by psychologists or people that are trained in organization behavior or, or other, other ways. And again, this is a university. You know, universities use professional people for everything they want to be excellent at. Physics, biochemistry, mechanical engineering. Um, and so that's what that's what we say they need to do with their leadership programs as well. It's kind of, it's real pretty simple, you know. Just be professional about it, and uh, and and then you'll make a difference. And and we also argue strongly, and this has to do with the core function principle. But if you are only doing a leader development program for fifty or one hundred and fifty highly selected individuals. What you're really creating is a concept of elitism around leadership mm. and privilege around leadership. And none of that is good for our society. So we think it's very important that leadership qualities be imbued in everyone who wants them. Every student who wants them should be able to improve themselves and develop uh, and, and not just a an elite few. Excellent. I'm so glad you um, you emphasized that point because I think one of the key things that makes your program so effective is it is available for anyone who wants it. But that's the key. They have to want it, right? They're, they're going to be making some commitments as well. So this has just been awesome, Tom. And I want to emphasize to people to get a copy of your book, because whether you are in the corporate world or in the academic world, there is so much information in this leadership reckoning book around the very things that Tom has been talking about, including all the ways they measure their program. It is so impressive what you have done and continue to do to add refinements to your program so it's the best possible one that it can be. I know some of my listeners are going to want to keep up with this um, initiative and the classification that you've got going with Carnegie Foundation. So Tom, tell people, how can they learn more about what the Door Institute is doing? And, and you, uh, if they want to connect with you and just staying in the loop about things. Sure. Well, it's very easy. Uh, you know, if you go to the Rice University website, we're easy to find, door.rice.edu, and that's D-O-E-R-R. Um, you can send an email to leadership at rice.edu, uh, and we'll respond to you that way. I'm very easy to find. I'm thomas.colgitz at rice.edu. Um, and, uh, and, and again, all of our people are available on our website and, and can, be, uh, can be connected with. So for example, Ryan Brown, who's the uh, psychologist who does all of our measurement. If you have a measurement question, go to the website, contact Ryan. Ruth Reitmeyer organizes all of our coaching and coach training and, and so forth. Go to Ruth on the website. So it's very easy to, to figure out what your interest is. And, and if it's general interest, I'm happy to talk to you. But if it's about coaching, or about measurement, or about the delivery of programs. They're all people there uh, who do that for us, who are easy to find and very approachable. So happy to do that. Excellent, thank you. Tom, I wanna thank you again for the leadership you are displaying in, the, in putting together this program, continuing to make improvements and the vision that you and the others there have for making this just a very powerfully impactful program throughout colleges and universities in our country. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. 
Now, head over to growstrongleaders.com slash free and grab our ebook, Listen Like a Pro. You'll find out how to connect on a deeper level with the people who matter to you. And while you're there, check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.